You know, Dan, it struck me listening to you and listening to all our speakers this morning. Um, what I'm hearing from the four of you is a big shift in emphasis. You, you know, this idea of, of sharing knowledge you have around the genome, this idea of saying, okay, we have our goals, but we're going to measure it, and we're going to show you that we're achieving all of our goals. That, that this old, old idea of multinational companies, do you know what I mean? Having their knowledge and keeping it all locked up in secret in case anyone else would get a competitive advantage. That's not how we're going to meet the kinds of challenges you've all been talking about here this morning. I mean, Stan, you would want to use those words directly. Transparency and accountability jumped out and eat at me because, you know, the minister will tell us, you know, these are words politicians use, um, you know, they use to talk to a public, but these are words now our food companies really have to use, don't they? Well, grab a microphone there and answer that, and I'll start talking. They, they have to use what, what, when, when they're trying to engage everyone they're working with and the consumers they're selling to. Corporate reputation matters, and um, I think that's what's uh, more sustainable in the future than the transaction that you have next week or next month or the new product offering on the, uh, on the shelf next week that may not be around next year. Um, you were under the microscope, which is, the, that's how the world operates. Uh, the information world and technology has changed everything. And um, I think consistent with uh, population growth that was alluded to earlier is the importance of size and scalability in a safe and sustainable way. So that it, it, it's just, all, it's, it's imperative, it's necessary, and uh, it's, not, uh, it's, it's not optional. Right, absolutely. Actually, uh, just on that, there's a specific question for you. Does Kerry Group think that an online platform like ZX is adequate to demonstrate sustainability of suppliers? Uh, it's, it's just one measure. Uh, uh, the term so you can't was get carried away with one particular measure. It, it, it's, it's like operating your yeah, own. Uh, and, and, and the term was used, uh, uh, trust and verify. Uh, uh, you've got to apply that as well. Right. And um, the, the other thing I was very interested to hear about, you know, and there's no doubt as you repeat the challenges we face, you know, ago, I wonder will we, um, but because they are fairly formidable. Um, but to talk about water, which is a resource that so often we take for granted, but even in our own country where we have so much of it, uh, farmers, you know, uh, uh, all of our food, we've all been preoccupied by the fact that we had too much of it when we didn't want to and not enough of it when we did. It's, it's really becoming, even in a country that traditionally didn't have to think about water, uh, a big issue for us. And right across the world, water management, either scarcity and then flooding as well, which tends to be part of the same thing. This is an enormous problem we're all going to have to wake up to, isn't it? Well, it, it's funny. I was, I remain one of the water subject matter experts for the, the corporation, in addition to sustainable development. So water is near and dear to my heart. And, and while I quoted the fact that we met our 20% water reduction goal in our direct operations early, to put things in perspective, that equated to about 16 billion liters of water saved across our direct manufacturing operations. And we certainly patted ourselves on the back and you know, goals are remarkably motivating and we were able to meet that goal, which is great. If, however, we were able to improve by 50% the applied water efficiency of a single crop in Mexico, we would surpass that 16 billion liters of water. So it really gives pause to think about while you need to continue to focus for a variety of reasons on your direct operations, the real prize, the real impact is in supply chain. And you know, the globally people quote 70% of water uses from agriculture. In so many of the developing and emerging markets that are critical to PepsiCo and our peer companies, that's as high as 90%. So I mean, it, 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 is, it is the most compelling picture I can imagine for companies to engage. And we're doing things really across the business and across communities, ranging from something extremely sophisticated, like something called iCrop that we developed at the University of Cambridge, which delivers water to the root zones of plants when they need it and just the amount that they need, to something as simple as a $7 tensiometer 
that now thousands of farmers are using to grow rice in India. So I think you know, that armamentarium of varied solutions is what's going to be critical going forward. And it's not just about doing that because, you know, cynical journalists like me have a tendency to look at people like you and say, oh, that's great, but that's all PR. The way that you show it is actually substance. And I think that the four of you have been talking about that really, really, um, in a way that's very illuminating today, is about saying, no, for instance, Indra, this is what we're doing with the cloudy butterfly. You know, it, it, it's not, and this is, these are important things because we can all get that. So that there is a job you have to do which is way more than PR, it's, it's actually re-education. Do you want to take the microphone and, and make your poor voice have a go at that? Is that on? Yeah. Okay, just sort of going back, to, I'll try to answer those three things together. Um, corporations historically have had a bad reputation and I think there's no getting away from that. And I think lessons we have learned is that transparency is really key and uh, being trusted is quite key. And if you can't achieve those two, then everyone has a right to shout at you. And Nestle's shift towards being more transparent, I, I think one of our greatest uh, sort of achievements to date was when Oxfam actually scored us number one in their scorecard, which was just unbelievable for us. But you know, and, and also the Dow Jones. So you have to go out there, be transparent, and you physically have to show on the ground you're doing something. It, it, it's great talking about in 20 years we'll do this, but it's doing short-term adaptation mitigation, adaptation work, and also in the long term, showing that you can create value for society and your business. So to answer you, the clouded butterfly is a great example for me because that is showing that in a real pragmatic <coughs> term that you can go out there and actually do something for the community. And uh, companies, I think, will do more and more of this. And I think Origin Green also has, the, you know, one thing it will learn, it will get challenged. And the more you say, the more challenged you get, and the more robust you have to be in your yeah, measurements. I think it's, and th there's a specific question for you, whether, whether you see consumers playing a role in aiding the sustainability innovation in the future. Yeah, and I think um, consumers play a... Do you know, in other words, so that you're held to account, you pass on more information to the consumers, they become, uh, the whole beyond the label thing, they become more informed and it becomes this kind of circle, doesn't it? The, where, where everybody's reinforcing each other and trying to yeah, and achieve these goals. Beyond the label does that. It, it, we're getting much more engagement now with consumers through that. And I think finding mediums uh, <laughs> to talk and have the conversation with your consumers, what they want, not just about the product, but externally what they want from that trusted product is, is quite, quite a big thing. Daniel, I mean, we are all going to have to get a lot more flexible, and maybe that includes the things that we eat. I was struck by this phrase, orphan crops, and, and, and the work that you're doing there. Yeah, well, I think, I think in that area, that isn't uh, so much changing what we eat, but rather responding to the needs of the people that are eating these crops already. So, um, I mean, I think changing diets is a critical piece, but if we can get the key materials that we're all eating now to be more sustainable, I mean, that, that's a big step along the way. When you talk about certification, and you've all said how important that is, I mean, traditionally, where does certification come from? Or, you know, does it come from, are, is it your critics, you know, who argue against big companies like yours? Is it international, global bodies? What's the relationship, the tensions with all of those? Yeah. Maybe, maybe you'd all address that, actually. Yeah, I mean, for us in Cocoa, if I just talk about Cocoa, we see it as a critical enabler to helping drive productivity and, uh, and minimum standards and social environmental pieces. So. Um, for us to commit it to be across all of our brands and to want the whole industry to move, you know, I think it, it demonstrates that this isn't something small that we just want to do on one or two brands as a PR thing. We see it as a systemic tool to help resolve the issues. And I think as we look across other core raw materials, for example, coffee and tea, palm oil, it's, it's the same model for us. All right, Dan. One of the watchouts, one of the watchouts with certification 
while it is certainly good and while it is certainly a tool to help battle claims of greenwashing or bluewashing, certification is also a lucrative industry. And there are many organizations, seemingly one new every week, that arises with either a new certification scheme or a ranking or a rating. And I sort of hinted at it in my presentation that some are much more robust than others. And I think we need to be mindful of that and we need to be smart and efficient. And one of the great values of collaboration is when we collaborate within a sector and across sectors, it allows us to try to prevent redundancy and dilute efforts in things particularly like certification. And you know, when you put yourself in the position of a grower, he or she may have 10 different organizations over the course of a year come onto the farm and say, we have this certification or this verification, and they're all different. How on earth can we expect the grower to continue to remain viable when they are taken away from what they do best, which is running the farm? So I think the more we can advocate a kind of a convergence of different certification schemes, the better off everyone will be. And Stan, isn't that one of the strengths of something uh, like the Origin Green Scheme? Because this is not just a benefit to consumers, but it's also a huge benefit to the companies because there, there's one simple scheme there, there's one set of standards, so everybody knows that they're, you know, they're working off the same sheet here. Yeah, it, w it would be very easy for it, an organisation like Kerry in Ireland to just operate independently and, and uh, say, well, we're going to just do our own thing. Uh, in fact, that's absolutely <laughs> not what we believe in. And in fact, we believe that uh, initiatives like Origin, Origin Green are for the greater good and in the greater good into the future and organisations will prosper in, in, in that environment. So it's, it's for the greater good. It's for the greater good and I presume Linda you'd agree with that as well. Could I just, I just want to add one thing to that because one of the things that Aidan shared with us last night at the speaker's dinner was it, we talked about pride of ownership with Origin Green and how comprehensive and robust it is. And certainly there are a lot of certifying organizations that maintain that pride of ownership almost as their IP, and they really are hesitant to share it. Aiden again impressed me by saying, the best measure of success for Origin Green is if everybody stole it. And that really does summarize, the, I think, the collaborative nature of Board Via, but also <coughs> the impact you can have when you lift and shift something that works much more globally. In a way, I think that's something very 21st century, isn't it? You know, you know, the 20th century was knowledge was power, so I kept it all locked up. The way to have knowledge powerful in the 21st century is to share it and get as many people as possible, you know, signing up to that particular standard, that particular set of knowledge principles. Anyhow, what you want at this stage is your lunch, so would you please give a very warm round of applause to our panelists this morning? <laughs>